There's nothing on board blocks for this, right? There is. There is? No, but just information, but we already have it. All right. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Would we all please stand rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this tonight meeting is of uh, the school board is a presentation meeting of our review of our capital projects. The presentation will be done by uh, Mr. Hayes from the Hayes Design Group. You wanna um, do roll call? Are we gonna do roll call? Yep. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Mr. Christensen. Awesome. Mrs. Dobos. Here. Mr. McGregor. Here. Mr. Modrak. Here. Mr. Nagel. Here. Mrs. Rule. Here. Mr. Scalzo. Here. Mr. Spacuza. Mrs. Turner. Here. Seven members present. Thank you, sir. As stated before, this is just a meeting to review our capital project at IMS. And we'll have a presentation from the Hayes Design Group at this point in time. Uh, let's talk to Walsh. Any other messages we have to beforehand? Uh, no, so this is going to continue where we left off at the last public meeting on construction. Uh, the Hayes Group took a lot of feedback from the board about the state of the drawings and the project. A lot has happened in that interim period both in the drawing work that he's accomplished and in uh, some of the, the progress the board has made with the larger feasibility study and getting feedback and direction on that larger issue that's still pending before the board. Uh, tonight, obviously our priority is to keep the board updated on the, capital, on the uh, work at IMS and where that stands, what action we'll need from the board in the future, uh, give you some that clarity and then perhaps also take some time to talk about an, an optional way of approaching this project as an energy savings project get some feedback from the board on that option and mr. Hayes has quite a bit of experience with that um, approach having done the project at um, Peters Middle School in that up so um, let's let him uh, start from the top and work his way through and we want to make sure the board leaves tonight number one priority is a complete understanding of where we are with the IMS project and what else um, what other approaches we could take with that and then if there's additional questions and concerns or ideas that the board has this would be a great time since we have him here okay thank you sir. and again the public does have the ability to make comments and that will be at the end of the meeting and we'll remind everybody at that point in time on the call-in system uh, that we are still utilizing which the phone number is 412 Eight five one six nine one one. But those public comments will come after the presentation by the Hayes Group. So at this time, Mr. Hayes, if you're ready to go, yes. Uh, Thank good, you. Good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Modrak and uh, Dr. Walsh. Uh, glad to be with you um, again. Uh, a little over a month ago, we were here to review the schematic design, scope of work, and the status of the drawings. At that point, as Dr. Walsh mentioned, we received a lot of comments. Uh, we've been working um, with really 20 plus people uh, in our firm, our structural engineering firm mechanical, electrical, uh, engineers, food service consultant. And so we, we've been making a lot of progress. In fact, just want to take a moment. I can't hear. Yeah, so I just showed everybody the uh, set of drawings, um, which I'm not going to go up to anymore. I just want to thank you. Um, and it's the current 85% uh, design development set, uh, which again consists of architectural, structural, plumbing, mechanical, HVAC, electrical drawings uh, for the project. Um, and, and again, they're, they're, they're well on their way, which is again based on the schematic design that the board approved. So tonight what we want to do is just give you an update uh, on where that is. Again, a lot of meetings have happened in the interim. Uh, we also went back uh, at the request um, of district administration to talk to a uh, few teachers uh, uh, to, again, get some further comments uh, from them. So we're going to review the kind of the scope of the work as it stands right now. Um, we we're, are going to go over some of the key changes uh, in the plans, uh, and that includes some work that has been added. 
uh, which we'll go over. And then we have an updated conceptual cost estimate um, to go over. And then we also have a small matter at the end of this first section, which is, again, focused on phase one, which for everybody's benefit is the creation of a sixth six grade wing in the IMS on the first floor of the IMS, um, as well as some ancillary re related work. Um, so with that, actually, um, with us remotely are Andrew Campanero of our office, Mike Smith of our office, and Matt Dawson of our office. So at this point, I'm going to ask Mike if he could uh, walk us through uh, some of the key design changes that arose since the SD approval meeting. Mike, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Very loudly. Okay. Very loudly. Okay. Great. All right. So, um, the first thing I wanted to do was just kind of update everybody on the, on some of the meetings we had in design development since the last time we talked. Um, we met with we met with teachers individual um, teachers of the spaces you know, that we are going to be creating. So that would be sixth grade teachers. Uh, special education teachers, uh, their language teachers, um, and then we also met with the administrative staff to talk about the administrative suite. Um, we met with um, Mandy to talk about the maker space that we're going to have. We met with uh, food service to talk about the impact of sixth grade on the kitchen and the cafeteria setup. Uh, we, we met with uh, the teacher union rep for the building to talk about additional comments that he had as well as other comments he's been fielding from teachers. Um, we met with technology direct, the new technology coordinator to discuss technology systems. So we met with the local Bethel Park code official to, to talk about um, our interpretation of building code and make sure we're all on the same page with, from a, a building code approach standpoint. So we had a lot of series of meetings that went into um, into the updated design development drawings and eventually what you're going to see is the updated conceptual cost. Um, so, so like I said, we just, we had a lot of good meetings, um, a lot of feedback from those meetings that we used to adjust the plans. Um, one of the things I wanted to show you before I talk about the, uh, floor plan that's on the screen is how we met with the teachers, how that meeting, um, those meetings were facilitated. Um, Kevin, did you share the um, 11 by 17 booklet that's on that table? Is that on the table as well? It shows the enlarged plans? Uh, yes. Yes, I did. And, and I'll pass that around at this point. And then everyone should have a copy of a one um, 11 by 17 page that says life skills and special education, in the, something along those lines, autistic support, life skills. So, this, so that page, if you can turn to that page that you should have in your packet. So that, the, the purpose of putting that page in your packet is just to simply show you this is, this is what we created here to go over with the teachers. We created a layout of each of, each of the typical rooms, and we're showing you here a layout we did for, for special education where we talked about what would be built in the room, how the room would best be laid out to facilitate, you know, how they want to teach in the room. What's the teaching room want to look like? How much casework should be in each room from a storage capacity to, you know, make, make the rooms as efficient as possible. So this is just an example on um, that special education life space page that Doug has now brought up on the screen. Um, I wasn't going to walk you guys through this too much more than that. I just wanted you to be able to see, you know, this, this is the level of detail that we went with. Um, into the meetings with the teachers to talk about really the layout of each individual room. So that booklet that Kevin was passing around is just an example, shows you all the different typical spaces that we put together and, and what we use to meet with the teachers. So then if you can go back to the overall floor plans, you had uh, the colored floor plans. So, a couple of other things before I walk you through this, um, which is going to be very similar to what we saw in schematic design, but 
some of the feedback that we got from some teachers that you'll see in some of the changes here. Um, yeah, and, and then you'll see us talk about a little bit more when we show you the updated scope of work document. Um, was in the second floor creating a second, a, uh, a, a, another classroom for world language, um, creating some usable space in the locker room area, down on the ground floor um, for, for maybe a fitness room. Um, essentially, the locker rooms that in this building, existing locker rooms, are really oversized. Um, there's a lot of shower space area that really aren't utilized. So that was one of the feedback we got from, um, from the meeting with the teachers was it would be really nice if they could create an, an adaptive PE or a fit, slash fitness room really in that locker room area down on the ground floor area. Um, and so, so now if I, you turn your attention to these, to the floor plans that are on the screen and in your packet, I'll walk you through some of the changes and where we're at and kind of orient everybody, really orient everybody to where we're at in the design. So if you can look in the middle of your screen, you'll see that's where the main entrance is, that red circle and arrow, um, and that. So we come into the main entrance, we have our secure vestibule, and then the purple area is a reconfigured administrative suite to facilitate that secure vestibule and to provide additional spaces um, to support, you know, bringing sixth grade in like a second um, assistant principal's office and, a sec and a another counselor's office. Um, so we re reconfigured that purple area after meeting with the administrative suite talking through the administrative staff, including, um, you know, the, the principal, the former principal, the assistant principal, and the counselors. Um, if you go down that hallway to the to the right where the green area is on the screen, that's the sixth grade wing. Um, that's where the sixth grade classrooms are being created. Um, most of this should look the same as it did to you all in the um, schematic design phase. What changed really in design development what was, is what's happening inside the spaces, you know, what the amount of storage, the locations of sinks and teaching walls, the things that I was going over in the large, in large plans. Um, if you go back down the hallway to where the existing ramp was and the new stair is at the top of the page. Um, so we finalized the location of the stair and the location of the elevator. Um, we had some minor modifications to the sewing lab that's right to the left of the stair. That was required in, because there is some space that is going to be lost um, because it was underneath the ramp that was, that was helping um, there's some storage space and a laundry space for the sewing lab. Essentially, it was underneath the ramp, and it will have to be um, demolished, and we'll have to reconfigure some of the sewing lab in order to bring the you know bring those programs back. Um, so that that's the update to the stair and the elevator on on the northern side of the plan. If you go to the southern side of the plan by the gymnasium, you'll see the new elevator with the, with the red box around it. That is the elevator we talked about in the last meeting, adding that elevator to serve all three floors and mostly to get us down to the gym. So that's the location that we landed on that would best suit serving all three floors from a cost efficiency standpoint. And really, um, it's really the best place for it to go when it, when it comes to looking at how it affects all three floor levels. If you go to the second floor now, if you go to the next page, um, up here, what we, we had a couple of changes up here. We were able to add, a, add doors from our new, uh, new stair at the top of the page. Um, we were able to add some doors directly to the exterior there, so we'll be able to exit that stair to provide another means of egress from the building on the, on the second floor. Um, you'll see, you'll notice on these plans, we no longer have the toilet rooms, the large group toilet rooms. Um, they are no longer in the project. After meeting with code officials and talking through what they would require us to do, they were, were, would require us to add a fire alarm and or to add fire sprinklers and upgrade the fire alarm in those rooms if we do anything to them, um, which would require us to take all the ceilings out on the second floor in order to run the supply lines to those rooms. So ultimately, we decided it would be more cost effective to wait to do that work when you plan on renovating the second floor in a later phase. Um, 
And then lastly, on the second floor, what you'll see is we just we updated some of the classrooms at the bottom, adding another world language classroom. So there's four world language classrooms. And then we created a office space for a security office at the top of the stairs as we as we wanted to create, uh, give, as we wanted to give an office to um, the 21st century learning teachers that are adjacent to their classroom. You can also see at the bottom of this plan where the ele how the elevator touches the third floor. Um, we come down that corridor on the south side of the plan and go into, if you're familiar with the building, you come into that lobby area outside the cafeteria and that's where the, that's where the stair would be, or the elevator would be. If you go to the last page, you'll see some changes down on the ground floor. You'll see that elevator at the top of the page, how that elevator would tie into the ground floor. It would be at the end of the hallway there. Um, and then the other change that we did down here is we are showing a temporary fitness room um, slash adaptive PE room. And the reason that we're showing it as temporary is that our recommendation would be that when you do elect to move forward with a second phase of renovations that we look at reconfiguring the locker room area completely as they as like I said before they're very over, they're oversized there's too many lockers in there for what you, what the school needs at this point and there's an opportunity there if, those, if that area is reconfigured to create a, a better location for that fitness room and really best utilize all that space that was down on a lower level uh, before I go on to anything else, I just wanted to pause there and see if anyone had any questions on the plan. I, I was wondering about this adaptive phys ed room. So you're saying to start with it like here and then in the next phase, change it? Will the change involve much more i mean i don't know about doing something now and then changing it shortly thereafter that's a good question i mean it it depends <clears throat> and that's where maybe we'll get into talking about that a little bit more after um we kind of go through the update to where we're at with ims right now because if you're going to wait three or four years to renovate the building in phase two then maybe you build this room this temporary fitness room very um very cheaply um drywall partitions and uh, a cheap acoustical lay and ceiling and some VT, vct flooring just do something very very cheaply that allows you to have an adaptive PDA room for four years five years until you're ready to renovate the rest of the building if you're going to renovate the building and then move on to phase two in one to two years then i think you just you don't do this work and you just try to live without an adaptive PE room for a year or two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got a question. Um, with regards to we changed the LGI room to two rooms, um, could those be changed to classrooms if we get into the 275-300 range and need four teams instead of three in sixth grade? based on numbers coming through in the next couple of years? I mean, I understand currently right now that our numbers are in, in that greater low, but I'm concerned that, if, you know, looking at classrooms, do we have enough? The short answer is yes. I mean, that's, how, that's why that room is set up that way, to have an operable wall down the middle um, so that it can be used from year to year as a large group instruction, or if you need extra classroom space, you can pull the wall down. Um, you have two extra classrooms. Okay, but that's not a temporary wall because that's the whole deal is to get rid of all these temporary walls at IMS. So that would be a permanent wall that we would have two small LGI rooms? So this would be a operable wall and so it would come down from the ceiling and it would, ha it would be acoustically rated so that it doesn't have the issues of acoustics that the operable walls have now that you have in the building. This wall would have extra acoustics in it to provide. I mean, it, basically, the walls that are in there now are 30 years old, and technology has improved significantly in the last 30 years when it comes to operable walls. Um, but it would not be a. It's not going to be a permanent wall now. Could Could you put that picture back up, Mr. McCausland? Yeah. Yes. Floor, first floor. 
There it is. Yeah, on the right side, the blue area on the on the bottom right side. Because I, I mean, my only concern is we're sitting at you know two forty six or something like that. I think at the last number in fifth and and or sixth grade, and the numbers coming up after that are in the two seventy and two eighty range. So I want to make sure that we do have the ability to have four teams. As that comes through, it's a cons it, it's a large concern moving forward that we do this in a way that we can accommodate all those kids. But this is set up for um, three, a, a class size of 300. Um, we didn't look to set this up for the current sixth grade class, which is, I think, the smallest you're going to see for a while. Correct. A, blip, a little bit of a blip on how, on how small they are. So we didn't really look at what that is today because of how small it is. This is set up for 300 kids. Currently, there's two teams of five teaching sixth grade. And so this is three teams of four. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question about natural lighting. I, I know that that came up in the community forum. And I'm curious to know, are we maximizing IMS to bring in um, enough natural light. I know that there's research showing that uh, just human beings in general produce, they're more productive uh, in an environment where you have more natural light. Their mood is better, their productivity is better. Uh, in, in, the in the current state that IMS is in, again, it's, and, and the community member kind of s described it this way, a little bit prison-like, okay? So um, is there a way that we can maximize the amount of natural light entering in throughout this building? Will we have a noticeable difference? Even if someone's walking around the exterior seeing that there have been big changes uh, to en enhance, again, the educational environment for our students. Um, well, we can we can certainly look at trying to do that. The pro if this building doesn't have a lot of windows, the way it is set up now and unfortunately the top half of the plan that we're looking at on the screen right now where the maker spaces the sixth grade classroom one classroom three classroom five are is all underground um when uh, yeah towards the top half there one three and five are all underground classrooms 10 12 the life skills room the artistic support room and classroom 13 all have windows into them um we can look at trying to bring some more natural light into the building it would require some you know some creative solutions that um would involve probably a little bit more demolition would involve more demolition than, than we were figuring on doing but if that's something that you'd like us to look into further we can certainly do that it would it would be nice to have data kind of showing what percentage of the rooms maybe would have natural lighting if you can kind of break that down or number of rooms uh, again, I, I just think it's really important. We keep on talking about social, emotional, well-being, mental health, and you know, if yeah. you're, you're in one one room that's you know totally closed off to natural light, and then you go to another class and it's totally closed off to natural light, and again, you know, depending on the schedule of the student or where those students are are located, I, I just think that with the new schools today have so much more natural light um, coming into the building that. There has to be some solutions that we can get and maximize the most light coming in somehow. If we could, if you can show us that, I would really appreciate that. Okay. Either maximize or I know with the layout it might be difficult to maximize it, but uh, replicate it. Uh, there are uh, ways that natural light can be replicated. Uh, so maybe take that into consideration also. Okay. Any other questions? Corner? No other questions? Okay, we'll move on. Yes, we, we can move on. Mike, if you want to move on. One thing I'll, I'll mention as Mike gets ready for the next section is that um, we, we can look at, uh, currently there, there's a concept called circadian lighting. And uh, we can look at that if the board wants to. It uh, costs a little bit more money, but it, it, it has, uh, using LED lights, you can um, correlate the color temperature of the light 
uh, to mimic the, the movement of the sun. I, the, the only, I'm sorry. The only reason I'm bringing this up is that, you know, if we're spending money on this building, are we going to see a significant difference? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we want people to go in and see, this is definitely not the IMS I went to school or my kids went to, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, you, you want them to go in and say, okay, this has vastly been improved. You want to see that payback. You know, if you're mm -hmm. going to put 20, 30 million, it better look Com like different, very, very, very different. Mm -hmm. That's the expectation. That's why I'm bringing that up. Sure. Uh, yes. I'm we'll, we'll, personally we'll more that. concerned with the the feeling different, the the educational environment, the the uh, as Mr. Scalzo alluded to, the uh, social emotional aspect of you know it being a welcoming, warm, inviting educational environment versus a prison. You know, so right. I, I think that's important. And quite honestly, I'm a little disappointed that we haven't touched on that since we brought this up early on. Uh, yeah, well, so Right. Again, I think you will see a difference. And, and that, that was the plan all along. I mean, the, all the interior finishes will be changed. And again, we're looking at phase one. It's kind of setting the standard for the rest of the building. And then the rest of the building would happen, of course, when we do phase two. Doug, if you could open up the document that says uh, additions to schematic design scope of work. What's it say? Mike, what's it, it supposed to say? It's the additional. It says, uh, at the top it says design development additions to schematic design scope of work. It, it, from a PDF standpoint, your computer, it might say something like DD scope of work updates. We don't have that. No. I don't, we, don't, we don't have that document. Really? Uh, no. All right. Mike, then I'm going to ask you to. Um, you can share it, Mike, if you want. Yeah, Mike, would you oh, okay. Can you see it? It's working. And there we go. Yes, just, just enlarge it, Mike. We can see it on the screen. It just needs to be enlarged. We can see okay. it if you just enlarge it. There you go. That, that's good. Okay. So th this is a summary of essentially what I kind of reviewed with you on the plans. Um, but we're just documenting here. These are, these are the changes that occurred to the scope of work of the project since we met last, uh, last time. So the first one, just providing the elevator to serve the gymnasium. We already touched on that. This is the new elevator that will serve all three floors. Um, the second one is creating that temporary adaptive SOZ um, and fitness room down in the locker room area. Um, that's in, that'll be included in our updated estimate. Um, the third one on here is reconfiguring the sewing lab so that um, the components that are lost underneath the ramp area are still able to be utilized um, so we can still teach and utilize a washer and dryer type of setup. Um, in the sewing lab. Uh, the fourth one on here is to create a security office at the top of the stair area where there's some open space where the cafeteria was, I think when the building was originally built, there's some open area up there that we can create an office so that we can relocate that office to, to serve another function, the existing office to serve another function. Um, then this next one, that item five, after meeting with the teachers and hearing their concerns about um, the world language area from an HVAC standpoint, what we had, we had originally planned on doing was replacing the HVAC in the world language area um, holistically as an alternate. We gave that as out, as, we put that as an alternate price in schematic design, but listening to the teachers and hearing their concerns that this the world language area is actually the worst area in the building from an HVAC standpoint, we decided to take that, eliminate that as an alternate and just put it into the base bit of the project. So that's one of the changes you'll see in the updated estimate. 
Number six, this is after meeting with the food service staff um, to serve the additional sixth grade students. Um, they recommend adding a fourth serving line to the kitchen area. This would be a remote serving line and would be in the corner of the cafeteria. When the building used to be a three grade building, they did have four serving lines. Um, and so that's the request to bring that fourth serving line back. The kitchen as a whole has the capacity to cook for three grades. They just need that extra space to be able to serve the students. Um, and then the last one on here is what I talked about from a code official standpoint. This is eliminating the second floor toilet room renovations from the project and moving that into phase two so that we don't have to open up the second floor ceilings and then put them back and have to do it again later in phase two. From a cost efficiency standpoint, it makes more sense just to move that work into phase two. So I wanted to just share that all with you before we talk about the, uh, the estimate. Can I ask why we're not updating all the bathrooms? I mean, that was on one of the things to do to begin with. What's the cost difference in that? And why wouldn't we just do it all at once is that would not be something that needs to be updated in phase two? Because honestly, I, I, I understand. I'm still saying what would be the difference to put that back in? Because honestly, you're gonna have kids using one set of restrooms and not the other. Well, I'd like to just add a little bit to that from my perspective in my industry. It's not only the cost, it's the, uh, the disruption. Uh, re take, taking out the ceilings to do the renovations that need to be done on the second floor when we're not prepared to do the renovations on the second floor yet. Uh, if it goes into the school year, the disruption to the uh, education and things. So, uh, I, I do completely understand that portion of putting that off until the uh, it, it, until we are ready for a second. It, it's a matter of timing, Ms. Turner. It, not, not a matter of doing it. We we will be doing it. It's we would have to. Uh, the code officials of Bethel Park said we would have to bring a sprinkler in for the entire floor um, if we did those two bathrooms. So we would have to open up the central corridor and other areas of the second floor so we wanted to not disrupt that the goal was to try to minimize disruptions to the rest of the building mike is there anything else you want to add or that covers it yep that covers it okay good doug are you able to open up the uh, opinion of probable cost uh yeah mike if you could stop sharing Mike just said. Yes, um, and, and Ms. Uh, Dr. Jen Santi, if you check your emails, I think you'll find that document there and that can be posted and, and shared with the board if that's okay. See if you have that, Seb. If not, I can resend it. Is this what you wanted? Probable cost? Yes. Okay. Mike, you want to take us through? Yes. Um, all right. So we've, we were working feverishly to update this um, based off all the changes that we talked about. Um, and so essentially where we landed here, if you look at the top part is the the top line item under uh, Roman numeral one are all the construction costs. Um, and where we landed here is that the total construction costs including design contingency of 5% and an escalation contingency and inflation contingency of 6% is is showing it at 9,520,000. Um, just for a frame of reference, we were around 9 million, um, I think 9 million 300,000 in schematic design. So it went up slightly because we added an elevator. We added a little bit of miscellaneous scopes of work that we've talked about in the last um, 15 minutes or so. So that's that's where that landed. Um, it, kind of, uh, you know, affects through the, the other line items on here, the construction contingency and the um, everything else below it. Um, I did want to point out, if you keep scrolling down, on the variable costs, um, we did have some additional variable costs that we did add in here. We had a fire line flow test performed to make 
to help us determine what needs to be done from a sprinkler line standpoint. Um, one of the things on the agenda is going over with you the request to have a geotech geotechnical investigation done in order to dig the elevator pits so that we know what we're digging into. Um, and then a, a small site survey in the area where we need to uh, replace the sprinkler line and putting in a new exterior um, stair. So everything comes, if you look at look how everything totals up, we're, we're showing a um, sort of project budget of 12 million with all the alternates. And then if you subtract out the two alternates, which is which at this point are the, um, the boiler plant renovations and the um, replacement of hot water heaters, uh, the total project budget is 11 million 200 thousand. Um, and then at the very, very bottom of the page, you, we just wanted to capture a couple of thoughts couple things for you there. The first one just shows where they're, you know, what, what was included in the hazardous material um, line item. And then the second footnote is just totaling up the, um, that, that shouldn't say contingency, that should say contingencies at design development. Um, but the number is accurate, 1,917,000. Just as a frame of reference, one, these numbers almost have $2 million of contingency in them at this point. Uh, any questions or comments on the on the budget? I'll just make one before anybody asks a question or comment, which is the, the, we feel this, the good news about this is that, again, this estimate that was done by our professional estimator is based on that 100 drawing set, which has a whole lot more information and allows them to do much more work and more thorough work on the estimate. And so we're, we're glad, you know, things are holding steady at this point. Um, and then again, we'll, we'll, another estimate will be done uh, midway through construction documents, which will be that much more information. So the, the good news is we're, we're moving closer to, um, you know, getting the scope that will be bid. Um, again, some of the scope creep added some costs. There were, there, the, again, the, there were some uncertainties um, and some placeholders that, that, dropped, that, that we were able to answer and they did not raise the price. They actually dropped the price. So again, we're, we're we feel pretty good about the estimate. Just a quick question, just a reminder. We have as recommended an alternative, the hot water boiler plant yes. and replacing the water heater with two high efficiency water heaters. Correct. They are functional at this time, but I believe we said they're coming towards the end of their life. They, they are at uh, the end of their expected life. So again, you, you've maintained them pretty well. They, they can last. Uh, again, the, the, right now the, the district is simply exposed to the possibility that they could fail at any time, and then you would be, at, you know, at, at the at the mercy of having to do something, especially in heating season or for the domestic hot water whenever you needed it. So, planning planning to replace them would be a better course of action. Again, that's that's what we talked. Just case there's new yep. people uh, joining our meeting here today, sure. so they understand. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Get, Mr. Hayes, can you explain a little bit? more clearly in like layman's terms the contingencies it's schematic design total like what what that actually means yeah the well right and the typo is it's it does, so right now within the budget we're we still have 1.9 million dollars of contingency so it's design contingency um inflation contingency or or you know uh bidding contingency and construction contingency. so that's money it's not spent um that that's simply at this juncture we're still trying to be conservative so that when the, the district chooses to, you know, um, budget based on this, that, that your number is adequate. So, again, and all of those will be managed. The design contingency, again, addresses some of the things we talked about tonight, some of that scope creep, things that as we've gone through the design and, and, and more thoroughly investigated, whether it would be a mechanical, electrical, or plumbing system, or IT system, or, uh, you know, food service system, or some additional programming and clarification you know we were able to add that back in you know into the, the project uh using some of that contingency so 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 in layman's terms that'd be money put aside for things that pop up during construction and, and design so there's and three design. there's three there's a design contingency so again as we go forward if there's things that are discovered that have to be added like for instance uh, we mentioned a couple times this geotechnical investigation for the elevator pit. So we have to dig into the ground for that. We, we want to try to know what that is. If that t turns out to be bedrock under there, 
then, then, and we find that out now, some of the design contingency will be applied to that cost, which currently isn't covered in it. Likewise, inflation, again, everybody around the table knows that it's a concern. We don't know exactly how it's going to impact if this is bid next spring. So again, it's just being conservative, trying to <coughs> anticipate um, that that might impact the, the, the bids that are received. And then likewise, there's a construction contingency. That's for things that are unforeseen. Um, including uh, a certain amount of errors and omission where, again, during the course of a construction project, you know, something comes up in the field and is unexpected and has to be addressed through change order. So that's just covering those. So again, the idea that the budget right now includes all of that, all of that will be managed. You know, what, what's not spent, you know, comes back to the district essentially. But in terms of, you know, what, what the board's getting close to is how are we, how are we going to finance this and, and that number, you know, we feel pretty, you know, we feel pretty good if you finance that $12 million, it'll be adequate to do this project. Mm -hmm. Any questions, Connie? No? Good. good. Then before we finish out phase one, we just, again, want to go back to, so we, the, um, with the two elevators, we need to get a sense of what we're going to need to dig down to. So we did get proposals. Um, on that and and the proposal that we want to award um, is is I think we have a copy Dr. Zensanti or Dr. Walsh I think you guys have a copy of that and and again um, Mike if you could help me remember what what's the amount of that of the geotechnical investigation 1780 yeah, it was on that it, it, it was just on that estimate I think it was 17820 yeah. Right. Like that. I have to right. pull it up here, actually. Right, and that's and again that's um, and that's an yeah. that, that's an estimate uh, given to us by the geotechnical engineer, and then in, m most about two thirds of that cost is for the drilling cost. So they will come out, they'll drill, um, and they will base the actual cost on what they drill. So they they drill down to bedrock, um, and, and and they estimate where that is based on existing information, and then about a third of it is their engineering fee. So. So we're asking, what we're asking the board to do is put that on your agenda for next week to approve that to move forward, and that's that's needed. By and the just to be clear, just to be clear, they're not drilling inside the building. They're drilling right outside our areas where we are going to have elevators, and they will extrapolate, uh, uh, you know, take using professional judgment and extrapolate that information to tell us what we should expect and what we should want to own on the document so that we don't have a. You know, a big surprise when the contractor gets out there to dig a hole. So I, I have a question. So this is phase one. This is putting sixth grade into the building with a couple other um, other add-ons. Add and this is the sort of like year and a half to two year project, right? Correct. Yeah, we're, okay. yes. And, and by, in the, by time frame, this, this current project, the expectation that it would be bid in the spring, awarded in the spring, and built, and it would be done by the fall of next year. Again, we've talked about this is work. It has to be done at IMS uh, and in the future anyways, regardless, regardless of the sixth grade moving up, because which we already agree we're putting that back. but. This is still work. It has to be done at IMS. Right. So. Yeah, and I think that, again, through the discussions we've had, again, we are aware that the board decided, you know, you're not going to move sixth grade uh, into IMS for the school year 2022-2023. Um, but the issue is trying to take advantage of your summer. I mean, because there's yep. going to be a fair amount of heavy demolition that needs to take place uh, in the sixth grade wing. So to try to do that while the school is not in session is a benefit. So it, it's a matter of trying to take advantage of the opportunity of a summer um, to get work done. It, you know, with the sixth grade not moving in, there's some There's two potential advantages. One is, uh, again, the deadline is always a question when you're publicly bidding. You know, will it get done? Uh, you know, the fact that sixth grade won't be occupying it gives you a little bit of contingency built into the schedule, so that if they don't finish by September 1st, they you know, should be able to finish by October 1st. Um, the other is is that it sets up in, in for phase two for the rest of the project. You know you're going to you, you will not be able to do all the work in the building at one time. Uh, you know it's too large of a building. 
um, and it would take too much time. You can't get it all done in one summer. Um, so the idea would be is you're going to need flex space in order to evacuate a, a portion of the building so it can be renovated, um, uh, but, but keep the kids housed. And again, this is the first step. It becomes a little bit of a Rubik's Cube. Typically, how you phase a project would be that there would be a section, in this case, the sixth grade area. You could um, move a portion of the seventh or eighth grade into that area and then renovate those portions of the area and then move through the building that way, which would allow you to continue construction through a school year or a portion of the school year and then, to, again, try to take advantage of uh, the summers to do your uh, major, larger major mechanical and electrical work. Okay, well, good. Next. I do have a question. Oh, good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are you done with? Yes. Okay. So this is more of a, a question on for the larger scope of things. I, I don't know if it's appropriate tonight to ask, but it's sure. it's in connection with the 11 options. Would you be willing to answer some of those well, questions? I, we, I, we do want to get there. There's some more three. IMS stuff on the agenda first. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, in terms yeah, of, sorry, I apologize. We, we, we're finished with the first section of the agenda. Okay. If, 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 if there are no other questions, we can go into the second section if you'd like. And, and again, this is really kind of a, uh, we have it on here. We'll, we'll be maybe moderating it, but I think district administration will share as well as board members can share um, as well. So really, I, I think that the, the, ne the next section of the agenda is, is looking at, you know, either doing phase one only at this time as a standalone project, uh, or thinking about doing it as part of a lot larger, larger total renovation project. So. Um, you know, if, if, if phase one is done by itself, it takes advantage of, as I just mentioned, the summer of 2022 um, with the fall 2022 as contingency. You know, if done as a sequ is sequential plan to renovate the entire building, it takes advantage of the summer of 2022 still and creates a flex space, which as I just mentioned. I think the other thing that you can look at is the phase one by itself um, may not qualify for what's called a Guaranteed Energy Saving Act project. Um, the, 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 the building as a larger renovation likely will qualify because of the amount of mechanical and electrical renovation work. And um, in a nutshell, uh, Guaranteed Energy Savings Act you know, implies, is implied by the title, meaning there are certain energy savings you're going to get when you replace the boilers and the mechanical air handling units uh, and the lighting in the existing building. Um, and that's guaranteed. Those savings are guaranteed. Um, and, and you're able to take advantage of those to help pay for um, either the borrowing or the construction um, of the project. Um, so, you know, I, I think at this point, I kind of want to ask the board, you know, where do we want to go with the discussion of that? Or Dr. Walsh, maybe you want to comment? We did discuss this with the board previously about the notion of turning this over to a a piece of project uh, there was some interest in it and it would if the board was interested in doing that it would direct on who we would want to look to to be a construction manager uh, that's a piece of it and second piece of it Warley would be is what's the board's commitment to phase two of the project how long of a gap between the completion of phase one and the start of phase two were we looking to have if any gap at all uh, would be two big questions that would help us answer whether this could move into a, an energy savings project. The other benefit to a GISA project is that the wouldn't necessarily have to go to public bid on the, some of these contracts, uh, which you get the lowest public bidder, and we've seen headlines regularly about school districts that get in trouble with the contractors that were the lowest bid and end up in court uh, fighting over fees, and uh, Mr. Hayes can talk about that. You know the contractor at the uh, Peters High School project that's still, it's yeah. more recently, right. going to get recover their money or try and get more money through the litigation process. So yeah, that's the question on the table right now: is is the board interested in that approach? If yes, what's your appetite for phase one rolling into phase two? Uh, so this could then be rolled into one project as an energy savings project. If we did phase one only, it couldn't be done that way. There's not enough energy savings to be realized in these drawings. So, so I have a few questions and concerns about this. Uh, first question is, Mr. Hayes, 
alluded to, it may not. I know we're upgrading HVAC boilers, things like that. Uh, is it guaranteed that it's not going to qualify for Giza? It, no, again, I don't consider myself a Giza expert, so that, that would have to be something asked of a you know CM at risk who does do Giza. Um, from preliminary discussions, again, typically you need large mechanical uh, renovations and large electrical. In phase one, we're actually not doing a lot of mechanical. That is, we're changing the ductwork for the classrooms, but we're not replacing the air handling units at this time. Um, th th those, those units have about five more years left on them, and so we felt that they could be kept until phase two is done and, th and, and made a part of phase two. So without the mechanical air handling units being replaced, um, again, based on some experience with these project, it, it seemed to us that they, they may not qualify. But if, if we didn't go to a full phase two and potentially added the air handling units, you, it may qualify us for those savings, correct? It, yes, it, it is likely to qualify you for those, again, for, to be able to do the project as Giza. And if you, right. if you committed to the whole project, um, you likely could do phase one as it's currently scoped um, and it would qualify as long as you're committed to doing the rest of the work later. Right, but what I'm saying is if we don't commit to you to doing the rest of the work, but we do potentially do the air handler units and then look at the rest of the work as another scope, say with a different architectural firm, different we could still realize those savings, correct? Yeah, yeah, I, th yeah I think so. Okay. Uh, uh, the reason I bring this up is because I feel like for the last two years-ish, we're always falling into this. We're behind the ball and we have to make a decision to have these savings or have these renovations done in time for this or that arbitrary deadline and we have to go with you because you're the one in-house and mm -hmm. and i'm really starting to become more and more alarmed by that uh especially when i saw this agenda i didn't even know bundling phase two into this was really on the table at this point and now we're looking at being sold phase two as a savings option no i, I, think, I mean look, and look, look. the option to add just the HVAC for those savings wasn't presented to us. I, I find that a little bit concerning. No, I, I, again, I'm going to be as, cl as clear as I can be. We, we didn't bring Giza to the table here. No, I, I did. So, I did. <laughs> right, right yeah. but the, what they did bring to the table is the entire phase two, not the potential of... No, just, just me bringing Giza as an option for the board to consider would right. necessitate phase two. There'd have to be a commitment to doing phase two for us to qualify. But not the entire phase two. We could do it just with an upgrade to the HVAC without doing the entire phase two. And okay, committing. yeah, so let's, okay. let's unpack the idea yeah. of the GISA project. Yeah. I think yeah. that's important. Yes. Let me, um, so in terms of my memory, um, we, rec we, in the last few years, had to completely do a renovation at Neil Armstrong to update the HVAC, do the wiring, and everything else. Um, and I think that uh, IMS is far overdue for a renovation in terms of its wiring, HVAC, and things like that we did at IMS. I mean, when was the last time IMS was renovated and how old is that building? I, I don't think the question is whether the renovation needs to be done. My question is whether we need to commit to Hayes to do it right now. To answer your question, the building was constructed in 1974 and it had three renovations, one in 1991, one in 2006, and one in 2013. Mr. Mitch, with the scope of those, the more recent reservation, do you remember the scope of that? Yeah. Yeah, the, the term renovation can mean a lot of things, I think, in this case. I mean, we, we redid some duct work 
uh, for the HVAC in the mechanical room. Uh, you know, I think that was that 2013 time frame. Uh, 2007, I think that was a part of Dr. Knight's asset protection program in which we replaced uh, the roofs, uh, some of the fascia, the, keeping the roof from leaking, uh, as well as my memory tells me a few um, uh, HVAC units. Uh, but the, the, to say renovation, I mean, classrooms weren't attended to. Right. You know, there wasn't an overhaul of, of digital infrastructure. Um, you know, of course, uh, our IT people have tried to keep up with putting new switches and those kind of things, but that was not a part of those the programs. The last major renovation looks like it was 1991. Yeah, yeah so 91. Say 91 yeah. when we moved the cafeteria down and we put classrooms right. in where the cafeteria yeah. was and you moved offices and you did all that was late 80s, early 90s. Correct, Doug? So, can I understand? We all agree we need to put work into the building. You're, you're objection is the process we get to that point absolutely There's, okay that, and that's all i mean so I, but that's what i think pam was also saying we all know that work needs to be done yeah. how does we get there to do it and like doc said he brought this proposal up and mr hayes's group just explained it to us again we're already committed to mr hayes okay. at this point for the first part so it's possible if i think mr hayes answered it if if we go with another architect it would still qualify us for this uh, Giza, but it doesn't mean it's a commitment to him for phase two. We just got to commit that we're going to phase two. Yes, I believe you have to commit to that. That's, that's my understanding. Or, or they, or move some of the work from phase two to phase one to make phase one qualify on its own merits. Okay. Would, would the design plans have to be in place to have that uh, realized that that savings realized through Giza? Would we have to have design plans? Yes that commit us to so what phase two looks like. That's no, no, I'm sorry. I, I, no, I, I thought you were talking about phase one. I, I apologize. No, you, so, you said with Giza, it does give us, the, did I hear you say the option in regards to hi, hiring the lowest bidder contractor? That, that Giza does, will give us an option not to be obligated to do correct. that. That's Giza, in a Giza project, you would sign a con guaranteed maximum price with a contractor it could be a construction manager at risk or it could be a general contractor to do the project at a guaranteed maximum price and incorporate certain energy saving uh, mm -hmm. scope of work. Um, and th that would obligate you to that contractor or construction manager at risk. They would then subcontract the mechanical, electrical, plumbing and all the other work of the project. Because there are two districts in the South Hills, one more recently and one who opened their high school a couple years ago had problems with the lowest bid contractor, not naming who the contractor is. That's not our issue. But the problem I know, because I worked at the one district, that held us back on that district's plans of getting into their building for almost a year. So I think at the point where I could see where that alleviates some concern over the lowest bid contractor not living up to their potential. And again, two neighboring districts have had that problem here just recently. Right. It's an issue that has to be faced in the public bidding market right now in Western Pennsylvania. So, so it, it Giza, <laughs> gives, Giza gives us that advantage to circumvent that. Right. Okay. So do, uh, as part of tonight's meeting, do you have a plan for phase two for us to consider? Is that no, part of this meeting? No, no we don't. It would, be the rest okay. of, it would be the rest of the scope that's identified in the feasibility study that needs to be done at IMS. No, we, again, th this, this came up literally, um, I think Dr. Walsh, two weeks ago, um, had a conversation uh, with, with another school district. So uh, again, part of it was just trying to help the board understand. I mean, and, or you could just move forward with phase one scope um, as, as it's currently being designed and bid that, uh, you know, as a, as a separate prime contract, which is, you know, what, what a lot of the projects school projects in Pennsylvania go by. So that, that, that's and that, the, the that. board did commit to a construction manager and having someone, regardless of how we move forward with the project, to have right. a, a, a construction manager take over uh, the day-to-day the -day operations of the work site and the execution of the plans. And in the process of investigating options for construction manager is where we came across the notion of making this an energy savings project whereby 
perhaps the construction manager actually owns the project and takes us all the way through it. We don't have to deal with change orders, et cetera. It, it was a very appealing prospect. Uh, so we, I guess we needed to figure out if the board's interested enough in that, that we should then go look for a construction manager firm who is who, is, who does that work, who does energy savings work, as opposed to a, a traditional construction manager. I don't know if I'm using the right terms or not. Help me out, traditional. Yeah, it's it's uh, construction but, manager as advisor uh, would be more traditional, where you're hiring them to oversee a, a, a sep you know, four separate prime contracts or more uh, according to the separation acts. A uh, construction manager at risk would be a, a contractor who actually holds the contracts you know, under a GISA contract. I, I do want to make one clarification for the board ju just for your own information and that is you would, you would only need to commit to phase one if you entertained GISA. You would have to do a report that would identify the energy savings that would be obt obtained in phase two. You would not need to have complete designs um, to, to move forward with phase one. Uh, but you would have to have some overall vision, if you would, for the building. Again, some of that's already in the feasibility study. It would be a matter of just you know, identifying that and then looking at it from a GISA standpoint, probably working with a con construction manager at risk who does GISA work. Um, and having that report, so because I think that you know our understanding is that would be necessary in order to justify going forward with phase one, which would by itself perhaps not qualify to be a Giza to actually be considered part of a larger project that would be Giza. So there's so I have a um, so regarding all of this, exactly what. Do you want from us tonight, um, Dr. Walsh? And would you and or Mr. McCausland please make some kind of recommendation for us? Sure. So what we're looking to see is if, if we should be pursuing a construction manager who can lead us into this project as a, as a GISA project. Yes. That's what we're trying to do. We, we, we were trying to line up interviews. We have two potential contractor that would take this work as a GISA project. We didn't want to proceed until we knew the board was ready for it. I am. I don't know about anybody else. And just in the way of background, the board had issued an RFQ for this type of work back in 2020 and did accept proposals in February of 2020. But then, as we all know, COVID hit. And so nothing was done with those proposals. So we reached out to those firms that responded and asked them to update their proposals in the event that the board wanted to proceed this way so we were ready. Um, so we did get those proposals back last Friday. Um, we are prepared to score them and invite them in for an interview if that's the board's wish to proceed in that manner. Fellow board members, any thoughts, questions? It sounds like a, a, a good plan to me. You know, I do have a question. When we talk about phase one and phase two, and if we're making a phase one and, and uh, writing that letter, and we're going to do Can you turn on your microphone, Mr. McGregor? That we're going to do phase two. Um, is there a time frame that you have to have work started for phase two? It's a good question. I, I don't know the answer off. Okay. Time I, had. I, I would guess that there'd be some time frame that you'd, you'd, you'd want to embark on so, the second phase in order for it to be considered a, a joined contract. But my guess is you'd have some, you could, again, depending on the needs of the school district, you'd probably have some latitude to do it when it suits your purposes best. Would, let, me, let me ask the three. Would, us having more conversation next week, would that throw us off too much with the one week? No. Since we are meeting next week on Tuesday. Our, our intention was is to put a motion on the agenda for you to approve the construction manager next week. Okay. I think the recommendation from Hayes was you're ready to have a construction manager involved in the, in the at cost estimations, et cetera. So we, in pre we were moving forward for with that one. expectation to All have right, that so ready. We, we had a little more dialogue here then. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I was hoping for more dialogue, I think. Well, I mean, it, it, it's like right. a committee meeting. We'll have a little bit of our conversation, and then 
we might just have to have a little more conversation next week. But, but we can put it on the agenda and have the conversation next week, right? right. Yes, because I, I, I think... Because we all, yeah, we always talk about something before we vote on it. I think we should put it on the agenda and have the conversation because it's a combined meeting next week. Yeah. Right. And I think I'd, I, I would like to see what we're looking at for scope on phase two, too. Like where the scope is, what we're looking at, what. Sure. I mean, we're happy to pull. I mean, you all have it in your feasibility study. If you go to the IMS uh, building in the feasibility study, it's it's there. But clarity. The, uh, Mr. Hayes, you actually have it listed as three phases, so I'm assuming yes. phase one is probably pretty consistent. It's phase two and three that would be the remaining work to do yes. after phase one. Because I yes. did pull that right. up today and was a little, that's why I'm asking when I, I saw some of the stuff that was on the agenda based on the binder that I have, I agree with you, it was three phases. So I, I, a little more outline to review before Tuesday night, liking getting it on the agenda for Friday. So we had the weekend to digest. Well, again, there's one question. Mr. McGregor had a question already. You know, whatever, then maybe we can get the feedback from this dialogue here today. So come next Tuesday, we'll be a little bit more versed and ready to go. Okay. Anybody else, Mr. Scalzo? No, I am ready for uh, number three of the agenda. Okay. Ken, any else? And Connie? Yeah, I wanted to ask Mr. Hayes, any of these projects, I know the high school, we qualified for as a green project and got reimbursements and things. Yes. Will we be able to do that for any of these projects? It, it's going to be more difficult on a, you know, to reach that now for several reasons. In the last 12 years, the standards uh, in order to get the uh, green, you know, the green designation, you know, mm. either a, a lead or green globes uh, is a little higher, um, but, um, it, but it's possible. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. I think the, the I think the key with the again and it just because we won an award for that and everything. We did and yeah, money. We got a Green Globe Award for for the high school project in terms mm -hmm. of energy conservation. And and again, I think uh, Mrs. Dobas alluded. You, you did the renovations at at NAMS. Our firm was the architect, and that was done um, as a, a Giza project with uh, Train Corporation. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I would say there, if, if, if I'm not sure all of you remember but you know the, the the caution with a Giza project is the you know is scoping the project and pricing the project and that project uh, again we were acting independently uh, of the district not working under the Giza contract and, and found seven hundred fifty thousand dollars that train had just baked into their numbers and uh, we got them to remove that from the scope of work so save the district seven hundred fifty thousand dollars so you, you know it's not there are advantages um, and there, there's also some risks uh, with the Giza project, and you need to kind of be aware of all of them. Is, is that possible that you can, what you just thought of saying here, the risk and advantages, quick summary, then he can disperse it to us? Sure. And then that way, we all have dialogue. This is uh, Monday, that we would have some chance to review it, and then that way any questions we could have, give it back to Central. And then uh, we'll be a little bit more versed because we have Mr. Spicuza and Mr. Christensen have to probably have a chance to get some uh, review of this, and that way we can uh, have a full discussion and a vote on Tuesday. So fair enough. I like it. Okay. All right. And okay. We're, and, uh, and, nice. and and to that point. Yep. And, and and to that point, just so you understand what you're going to get from us, because I, I think I understand Mr. Mojack's request, but the traditional model would be a a, a traditional. Uh, four separate prime contractors uh, publicly bid uh, with architectural and engineering done independently. The traditional or the Giza model is everything, including design, goes under the Giza contractor. Um, what, what we found and what we've recommended to other clients is, is a hybrid uh, where you retain some independence uh, of your designers uh, in order to protect your interests in terms of the specifications and the quality of the work. Um, but you <coughs> and also uh, protecting yourself with regards to the cost um, that you're going to expend. Um, but you also take advantage of uh, the Giza, uh, particularly in being able to have a single single source contractor do the work and, and the benefits of that. So right. yes, we'll, we'll, I'd be happy to share some of that. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Can we be able to move on to what's uh, number three, I believe? Yes. And I'll yield 
floor to the district administrators to uh, look at the master plan options or talk about the master plan options. Okay, thank you. So uh, to update the board, we've uh, had some community meetings and we're able to review the feasibility study now with uh, internally extensively with the, the strategic planning steering committees extensively and with the community. Uh, they, the uh, conclusion uh, of most of those conversations is that there really are four choices that the board could consider that came out directly out of the feasibility study. And, uh, but, there is, but there is none of those options is to do nothing, that we were pretty solidly convinced with that report that work has to be done. The question is where, where and how do we make those investments in the facilities of the district, K-5 facilities and the middle school facilities. Uh, there was lots of good feedback that was provided. Uh, most of the people that participated in those sessions were, were leaning towards uh, option eight or nine, which would be a, uh, not to keep the five elementary schools, but to look at a new construction, whether it was a K-2 or a K-3 building, to move uh, NAMS differently. Uh, those were the, the basics uh, of the feedback that we got. Uh, Mr. Hayes is here. Him, he and his team were the authors of the plan, so here's a chance to ask questions about it to, to help clarify where you are as board members in position, uh, and then to give us direction on what you want to, what's next, where do we go from here. We're now at a point where it's, it's, um, it's getting toward a point where we're ready to start making some decisions, getting some direction, and maybe start moving some dirt. Uh, so that's what I would love to have tonight is conversation with Kevin about what questions you have, what other options were considered and rejected, and then um, get some direction from you on what you want next. Okay. I'll, I'll begin. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree that something obviously has to be done. Uh, with, I've been reviewing those options all 11 over and over and over again, and, and honestly, I'm not satisfied with any of them. I, I saw some benefit with nine at, at, at first, but then I took a step back and I thought about things and I'm reflecting on a little bit of history here. We go back to the open campus of the high school and it, during that time of the renovation when they decided, and you, maybe you can help me out here, Dr. J, was it around 30 million or so when they did renovate the open campus? of the high school right around there. It was 38 million oh, 30. back in 94. Yeah, right. Okay. Right, there. Yeah. All right, so almost $40 million went into the renovation of that open campus and that was 1994, is that what you said? And then, you know, you really look at the time frame. did you really get $40 million payback out of that? And I don't really think so. I mean, if you're, you're, you're investing $40 million and then you're building a new high school that's 90 million plus. So I think that was probably a misstep at that point in time where maybe that 40 million should have just gone right into a new high school at that time. So when I look at all of these options, I think that by putting money, let's say for example, in NAMS, if you're gonna reconfigure that to three, four, five possibly, if you're gonna put in millions of dollars into NAMS, I, I don't think we're gonna get that payback. I, I don't wanna repeat history, put millions of dollars into some of these schools. And again, I'm gonna throw this out here as, as a possible idea or an option. It wasn't, it wasn't one of the 11, but maybe even something to consider and even talk about. And you know, I just wanna make sure that if we're gonna invest money into this district, I mean, this vote that will happen one day is going to change Bethel Park for generations. So we have to make sure that we do not repeat any mistakes. We gotta go back and take a look at what happened with prior renovations. So my thought process was that if we can have a K through five elementary center as an option to look at, to review, K through five option would give us the opportunity to have even a primary and an intermediate school inside of one school possibility of having two wings, K-1-2 and 3-4-5 inside of that building. Now I wrote down a few benefits and I could have I probably written 
a, a statement that would have taken 40 minutes, but I, I'm just going to throw out a, a few benefits and a few things that I did write down. Having all the elementary teachers housed under one roof can help the district reach one of our major goals of the strategic plan, which is continuity of education. That could be helpful. It can provide more flexibility with common planning times throughout all grade levels. Professional development and collaboration can now happen together as a collective at each grade level. Curriculum meetings and collaborative discussions can provide clear expectations and goals that will unify our elementary program. And you can also throw in the possibility that we can, that we can also uh, have an all-day kindergarten program. The next thing that I really, and there are other benefits with academics. I can go on and on, but I'm, I'm trying to hit a couple of different areas. Obviously, I talked about economics at first, Academ academics was next, and culture. So I know that there's been a lot of talk about neighborhood schools and the culture and the tradition of, you know, if we, if we don't have those schools any longer, is there, are there ways, creative ways, to kind of keep tradition and culture even within an elementary center of that size? So I wrote down uh, a couple more ideas here. You know, think about this for a moment. Having students at one location for six years uh, can give us the ability to establish long-lasting culture for what it means to be a Bethel Park Blackhawk for those students. I mean, those students get to be there for six years years. It, it will feel more like a home. It will provide families even more stability, knowing that they are not jumping from one building to another building, that, that they are there for a long time. Now, on top of that, it will also allow students at an early age to develop relationships throughout the entire community because everybody would be together. So you are making and building relationships within your neighborhoods because you're still going to play with kids, obviously, in your neighborhood. But at the same time, you get to expand those relationships across the entire community. Having the building, possibly, now again, this is a possibility. Don't, I'm sure that you know, any, any scenario will have some negatives. But if you were to build a K through five elementary center, even on the grass fields, this practice fields up by the high school, if there's a possibility of that, obviously another location could be Ben Franklin. Uh, those two sites probably the, be the most centralized. Obviously, the one near the high school would be the most centralized. And by having that, you can create opportunities for our elementary, middle, and high school students to interact with a variety of programs. For example, if, if you do have a STEAM program that's also that's another goal of the district, K through 12, could you imagine, again, I'm going to leave this up to the teachers and the administrators to be very creative and think of ways that you can have crossover from one building to another where you might have high school students interacting with elementary students with maybe STEAM activities or programs. So you, can, you could really build a culture, a full unified campus with IMS, with an elementary center, and the high school. Also, uh, I was thinking about even within the school itself, how would you maybe keep that tradition and culture? and you know, even if you had intramural sports or even academic competitions, you could even do it by neighborhood. So if you, if you, wanna, if you wanna create t-shirts for those past elementary schools that they used to go to, you can still kind of keep that tradition even within. So if you have academic competition or if it's an intramural sports uh, of, some, of some kind, a program like that where they can compete at a very young age, uh, again, you're establishing so many relationships across the entire community. I just think that there's endless, endless possibilities. And I know that there might be issues that come up, traffic or a parking and, and things like that. But if we want to have a vision like that or see something come to fruition where we could have that, we can maybe figure out solutions to those problems. Uh, I know that elementary would start later, so it would be staggered, so maybe that would help with traffic in that area. Again, I, I, don't, I don't know the traffic situation. I'm not an expert with traffic around the high school and IMS and that campus, but there, we have one chance to, to make this right for generations, and I just hope that we can maybe think of adding a couple of those options to look at as a K through five. They, these students would have a K through five state of the art facility with maker spaces. It would be set up for steam. 
I mean, you are looking at facilities that can really help strengthen our curriculum. And again, the curriculum is, is built inside, right? That is something that's built by people. But if you have a building that can, that can help support that, that's gonna be really, really powerful for all those teachers and all those students. So it's, it's just a vision and it's just a thought. And I, I think that we would entice a lot of other, other people from other communities to take a look at Bethel Park and say, are they really doing that? I mean, could take a look at what they're doing over there, offering possibly all day kindergarten, looking at you know, unifying that campus, look at the culture that they're building, look at the curriculum that they are also building inside, in-house. There, there's so many advantages that would bring more people even to Bethel Park. There would be, I think, a lot of people scrambling to buy even more homes. Um, I, I just think that when you look at the future, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years out, my, my kids are very young. They probably won't even see it, depending on when the, if, the, if something were to happen. I'm, again, if I'm going to be here for the, in, in, in the entirety of my life, I want to see my community succeed and be competitive throughout my lifetime. This is my home. So again, probably wearing my heart on my sleeve right now, but that's, that's how I, I, I truly, <laughs> truly, truly feel about this. So I'll leave it at that. Hey, Mr. Scalzo, just to be clear, though, we're not putting kindergartners on buses with 12th graders, right? Let's, clear, let's kill that right now, right? right? So wait, <laughs> yes, yes, we will, we will be very careful with, with the busing. And again, there's going to be, I think any of the scenarios that you look at, there, there's going to be problems. Or, but again, that's just part of it, no matter what scenario that we pick. But what is it that we really want? We want a game changer. Like, we want other communities to look at us and say, you know, we, we are now on the map. We are really ultra competitive. Families are, there's going to be more of a sense of pride, too. Like, look at look what's going on here. I, again, that, <laughs> it's coming from the heart, so. So, so may I ask, are there any uh, educational or structural, structural reasons why that wasn't one of the pre presented ideas? Yes, and I'm going to maybe ask uh, Dr. Gensanti and Doug to comment because when we talked about K-5 options uh, early on in the feasibility study, the administrators just didn't think that was viable. Um, and so I'm just going to ask them if, if they can recall or, or want to speak to that and, and, and I can share some other thoughts. Well, I believe the, uh, the largest concern was the uh, size of the building and the number of students and, and really those grades would uh, overarch the size of the high school population and that that might not be as intimate as we would like it to be even though we can possibly uh, look at building schools within the school like you're suggesting but it was really based on size and, well, and, and I you know what that would take and in that space that you're mentioning you might have to go vertically to achieve to achieve that so that's a consideration also, you're not going to have an eight-lane Olympic swimming pool like the high school, and you're not going to have a gym that's going to be able to hold 3,200 people, right? So if you look at the, you know, the auditorium, too, it's not going to be quite as large. So I, I, You'll I need think multiple spaces, though. You can't right, you just do. have one gym. It won't, right. won't satisfy the need of the population. I, I, I would, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, following all of Vince's, comments I, I agree with you and I wish we were there right now in about two weeks I'm going to be sitting on the other side of the table and I'm thinking like all of us have agreed on the feasibility study and what we want to see done but most of the people that have tuned in on the radio or on the TV and on the telephone have been our population people that have kids in school 49 percent of your residents in Bethel Park are and the senior age don't have children in school and the, and the monies that we're going to have to spend over the next period of time probably we're going to have to go to referendum if you can stay away from referendum you have a better chance having been through the high school problem you know <laughs> i've been that route you'll have to stay on this side because it is probably not going to pass if it goes to referendum the other thing is that um with 
with what's needed. There's a lot that needs to be needed, but I think if you market it correctly, get out there to the senior population, you may win some of them over, but it's going to be a tough road, so you're going to have to really think about what is practical and what we would like to have. I wish we had most of that stuff now, and especially the climate right now. I mean, they're trying to put businesses out of business and, you know, where the money is going to come from, even from that population. So we're looking at kind of a critical time to be thinking about a lot of this. I think you have to move forward, but you've got to keep that in mind that the taxpayer is in a bad position right now. And your, your tax base here is 49% on the senior side. Right. Well, what I'm, Just something and, to and think what about. I'm trying to say is that by investing, and if it's a, if it's a little more up front, you're not going to run into those, if you go back and, again, look at history, look at the number of renovations that have happened across the district, you could eliminate a lot of that for a very long time. And you would also, if NAMS, you're no longer investing or renovating that, you take the money that was going to go into that and put that right into the elementary center. Well, I agree with you, Vince. I'm yeah. just thinking, like, when oh, you go to okay. sell it and up front now, yeah, it's yeah. the timing of everything, right. you know. But that's something that right. you're, you're going to have the challenge this time with that. Well, yeah. the, the, the point to uh, think the conversation is good is the fact that the plans we have that we're presenting and our, the group had focused on still involve building a new building. Mm -hmm. So well, that's why we're going to look at this. Now, real quick, I just pulled up our enrollment. We're looking at a building of just under 1,500. And I think that's one of the things we talked about. How would a building of 1,500 look? And how to look from our eyes, but more importantly from, from the kids and so forth. But again, this is something, and I think we're just having a talking point right now, is just to say what, what, what's, what's the whole picture going to look like? Yep. Because we, we have three sites that are ours. We, again, there's no land to buy in Bethel. Mm -hmm. Is the practice fields down here on campus? The ball field behind Ben Franklin, and then the ball field's down at Neil. And again, to to accommodate, but you know we had these conversations. It's like, is it worth? Because we don't have to make. We're not making a decision this month. The new board comes on, but we right. by summer we got to have some kind of knowledge or whatever time frame you think we get, we could have soon. We got to have this kind of finalized. So if he brings it up, and I agree, bring it up. We just we got to roll it out. Is it possible or not? And here's the reason it's not, all right? But it, it wasn't on part of it, and I would imagine reading through all those options is that we're limited on our space of what we're going to be looking at. You know, we talked, yeah. and Zeb brought this up 10 years ago when Blade Runner was up for sale, right, Zeb? <laughs> you, you said it back then. It's give you credit where credit's due. Right. Yeah. Yes, all right? Did. Could I? Yeah, I think the only thing oh. I would share in terms of enrollment is if you go to full-time kindergarten and you're looking at 1,800 kids in the building, you're, you're basically 300 kids per grade. So a full-time kindergarten, right. that's 1,800 versus, say, 1,200 at your high school. And you're right, you would not need a full-scale auditorium in the new elementary center. Um, you probably, with six grades, you'd be, you're looking, and again, it would be really important to get school within a school. So your point of three grades and three grades is possible. Each of those are going to be a pretty big building, though. You probably are going to need two cafeterias. You'll definitely need two gyms. Uh, it'll be a, it, it, it's going to be, again, just, it, it's, it's somewhat, a K-5 for this size district is pretty unprecedented in Western Pennsylvania. I don't, I can't, I'd have to do the analysis and I don't, I can't think of one that would be that size that has been built. I mean, the ones, the districts that are K-5 that work well, I mean, you know, Mount Lebanon is probably the closest example. Th their schools average 250 to 400 kids yeah. per school at K-5. So, it, I mean, talking one-third the size of what you would be building, um, it, it, it's just a consideration. If, if, the, you know, if the board wants to look at it, we can certainly look at it. I think it would be helpful to, you know, if, if you want to look at it, to, to do, you know, kind of a thorough analysis. If you remember, we developed a, a list of about, it, it was at least 20 criteria for a, you know a master plan option to look at right just kind of take a full 360 view of it and then take it through and see what your cost is I mean I, I'd also just offer for consideration you know that one of the things that drove you know some of the analysis of the master plan options was what is the cost impact right I mean that, that it, it's understood but in look just kind of handicapping 
you know, the, as, as we mentioned, one of the ideas of just keeping NANS a two grade school is because it's hard to add on to and, 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 it, and, and it's expensive. So the idea of keeping a two grade school is you, you basically keep the foundations, the walls, the, the roof, which again, in a building like that, like when you're talking new construction, you're gonna talk 10, $15 million maybe. Um, so that, that's, you, you, can, you can move it over and, and we can look at a new one. It, it's just going to be, and, but again, I think some of that thought, it would probably be helpful to put it on paper, right? Just to try right. to help the board. Well, that's, and, I, and I think it's our, the point is that to, to have that, you know, I, I, if, to have it on campus, which a lot of us are familiar, that's the Safayette model. We have everything. Again, but right. their, their community developed a lot different than ours. Right. You know, and I know for my insecurity wise, that'd be fantastic. Three buildings, egress, four, three roads, egress, easy to control in that, you know? But again, we, we don't know logistically for the parking and so forth and space and, you know, but I think this is right. part of it is like, can we have a further conversation, uh, you know, on the merits of pluses and minuses? Right. And right. I, okay. so I Kevin, agree. You had, um, you had done a, a thorough analysis of all four options in the feasibility study. Is it possible for you to complete a fifth analysis adding what was just described here as a K-5 building on the high school site? Yes. as option five to add to the mix of remaining four options. And that would include then all of the no. pros and cons and the costs, estimated costs, yes. and the savings that would be potential from mm -hmm. uh, the closing of what would end up being six buildings. Yeah. I, I, I think, could I? Um, <laughs> can I say something? Um, yes. I've not heard anybody talking about option one or three. so. I agree with you, Dr. Walsh, but I, I think we should just go eight, nine, and 10. I mean, I'm, I'm only here for a couple more weeks, but nobody's talking about option one, what is it, one B or three C. Correct. Everyone always, everyone's only talking about eight, nine, or what Vince just talked about, oh, I think. When it was 12. When it was well, presented to, yeah, 12. I'm sorry, Vince. It'll be 12, it right. Of, facility committee that you know that k-5 really wasn't presented right all right that, that's only fairness to that i don't recall that being and i'm looking at zeb to am i correct i don't remember us presenting that you're correct and it's not it's anywhere correct. it's not anywhere on any of the options yeah, that's what's correct. Correct. for it, that yeah. for that panel we had the review was an option so i'm sorry go ahead Ms. Wolf. one question one question i this this is directed to mr minch so can you give me uh some pros advantages for special education if you had a K through five building. The academics, no, I'm not talking about parking and logistics of traffic. I get that there can be issues there and that can be possibly looked at, but I'm talking about the education for that special ed student K through five. What, advantage, what, what advantages would you see in that model? Well, I think any time that you have diversity in your population, you know, uh, which we do in terms of special needs, um, you know, you're always trying to service those students the best you can with the staff that you can afford to bring in. And, and so when you, you're able to localize in a building, you're able to bring in those supports more consistently, I guess you would say. Um, things like, you know, OT, PT, uh, some of those people that come in from the IU, I think when you think about our ESL programs, you know, you always have more continuity with uh, specialized needs when you're able to, to localize those things in, in a building. Um, you know, anytime you ask staff to travel, that can be a hard thing, you know, for staff. And when I, I, I bring that up, because in this particular example you're giving me, I mean, uh, you know, ESL teachers, you know, being able to be in that building, you know, and servicing their, their, their spectrum of, of students. Um, so I guess from that academic standpoint, you know, being able to, to provide those supports uh, a little more cohesively uh, because those folks are there. So it could, it could strengthen our special education program. Uh, I would say within the, those contexts. That was one of the concerns identified in the feasibility study was that there were certain special education programs that weren't housed in every building. You would have to be transferred to another elementary school. So where you're going with this obviously is the fact that they would all be housed under the same roof and all kids would have full access to these re resources now not in building the building or 
Right, they would just wouldn't right. have to leave their home school. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So I, I would add to that. Could we look at if it's not feasible at the high school for spacing purposes to do it at Ben Franklin? Again, it's a ben centralized Franklin. center of town yeah. location. We're not putting K to five students on a bus from one end of town to go to the other. If I, I would yeah. really say, if it's not at the high school, yeah, the options. option two we is Ben both Franklin. Options, yes. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, and you know, we also have to look at, there are other districts within Allegheny County that do have K to five. There is a district that's close to us that just demolished a building and is building a K to five building. Um, I do know they have another elementary school. They have a kindergarten center, a K two and a K three, and now they're going to have a K to five, but they are keeping the other buildings. So K to five has a whole lot and it's less transition for these kids. They go six years in one building, three years in another and four years in another. We're not transitioning all around. And if you move within Bethel Park, you're going to the same elementary school. <laughs> you're not switching elementary schools mid section as you, you know, progress. So those are two positives that I see in this mm -hmm. process. And we get collaboration through all grade levels in the elementary level. We're not still having a K2 or K3 center and then four or five at NAMS where there's a split in academics. That's been a large concern. I have voiced it before that there's a split in academics and things are, you know, falling off the, 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 the thing, especially math at some point in time. So again, I would really like to look at, you know, I, th there's some precautions and everybody has told me since, you know, we never bought Blade Runners, there's a parking issue. I get that, I watch it every day. I have a high schooler. I know what the parking issue is at the high school. Um, but if we could look at this process and come up with some alternatives, again, high schooler Ben Franklin, K to five. And I would think the more you cluster the buildings, you'd have a bus savings too. Oh, I, I would totally so think so. So that's gonna be an impact too. And you would, and again, we're not putting kindergartners on the bus with 12th graders. Right. Exactly. We've run three bus schedules that, mm -hmm. those times. Again, the mi real middle school model then again, six to eight mm -hmm. where the time change is not with the high school. So again, mm -hmm. you could see a good savings. Yes. So an understanding is again, we, we all recognize we probably need to go with some new facility, new school building. We just want to make sure as a K to five is an option mm -hmm. based on our property and based on the scope of the work or do we look at the other proposals that were in the feasibility study? Sure. And okay. based on that would be two brand new buildings in this district in a 12 or 14 year period, yep. which is a huge Pretty enticement stable. also. Um, and if Connie's right with more savings and we're not throwing all this money into NAMS, which I think was built in the seventies also along with IMS. So, you know, 50, 60 year old buildings we're throwing money at, we could give kids a brand new. Again, I think you'll see in some of the, I mean, it, and we can certainly do that. It's not, it's not an issue. And I, and I would actually say that for the K-5, we, we should look at a third option, which would be just put it at NAMS, you know, and, and uh, I think there's room. I don't, there. I don't think th there's a good, th uh, honestly, as a parent that lives on one side of Bethel Park, for a kid to go the whole other side, or as Connie would say, from a kid to go from Cool Springs to NAMS, that's too long of a bus ride for a kindergartner. Again. Even if we have shorter bus routes, it's still too long of a bus Is ride. It, it's it, the whole part of this was bring everybody back to the center of Bethel Park. The center of Bethel Park is either Blackhawk Drive or close second to that is Ben Franklin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Um, I have a question um, regarding what uh, Connie said about referendum. Is that Amy sitting there in the middle? Yes. Amy, yeah. what? What can you? <laughs> What's this referendum stuff? <laughs> Going back to the funds to support. Did I misunderstand the question? No, it's, you're, you're fine, your but there's, it wouldn't be a need. <laughs> Pam, okay. it would just have to do. The referendum is a, to raise taxes above the index. Right. Yeah, you just go oh, 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 not, not, but if we, if we do the bond, we don't, okay. I, I get it now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, before we move on, I just I want to remind anybody who's viewing that public comment will be available during the end of this meeting, and you can call 412-851-6911 if you have any comments from the public. All right, I think we're good to move on. Yeah, and the last thing is that at the high school uh, water remediation project uh, where they're filling in, uh, you know, they, they've done the backfill, they've, they've put in the waterproofing, they've put in a, 
uh, new French drain that was damaged when it was excavated. But um, what they're finding is the, uh, the earth, when they're putting it in, is, is very saturated. And so uh, what they came to us in terms of they're trying to get it done because we only have weeks now and we're trying to get the project done. The uh, contractor said what they'd like to do in order to help them with their backfill and, and, uh, and compression uh, of the backfill is to treat uh, the soil, the rest of the soil that's being put in with lime. Um, it's, it's a common construction project to do that, to essentially dry out the soil um, and mm -hmm. allow it to be compacted uh, better. Um, and uh, they, they just uh, proposed a change order of $4,850. And when we reviewed it with administrators, they said, since we're having the meeting, can you share that with the board tonight? So I guess we're just asking if the board has any questions or issues with that. If not, we'll proceed with it. If I, if I can add, when we built the high school, we had to, we ran into a lot of snags with the earth and we had to remediate with lime um, way more than what uh, is proposed tonight to, to make it all work because the dirt was mm -hmm. just too saturated. So particularly when you're putting the top on that to spread it out and get it all right, compact it properly, the, you know, the, uh, it just rained and it got it all wet, so we got to fix it. A quick question. Is the plan to have the concrete and everything poured for this season, or are we waiting until the spring? No, we're, they're going to wait till the spring. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the goal is to, again, we're just getting to the point where pouring concrete isn't recommendable, and they're, they're not at the point to be ready to pour concrete. I, just, I was looking at it Saturday, and I could see that there was still work to be done. I'm just because right. obviously it's a mess right now, but. Yes. Yeah, so again, the goal would be to, to basically clean it up, uh, including cleaning off the sidewalks. It, it, again, it is a fire uh, exit uh, yeah, for the building, yeah, and so that it, would, it would need to be done, and so we're looking at the contractor. They're basically going to um, prepare for the landscaping and the concrete work that would be done in the spring. I, I, just, w I just wanted to piggyback on what Kevin was saying. It was originally planned to try to do the concrete work before the weather kind of broke for the worse but when we ran into this the uh the dampness of the soil and everything it just we'd rather have that remediate remediated and make sure it settles correctly before really the concrete uh okay. sidewalks down okay thank you and you have number five yeah number five would just be the next meeting i mean we're, we're scheduled for uh, january january 18th uh to look at the construction documents for phase one and what would happen at that point at that at that point we would be done again that the the final uh opinion of probable cost will be presented to the board and then the board will at that time decide are you going you know are you going to bid the project so okay that would be mm -hmm. okay Mr. McCausland, any phone calls i'm sorry any phone calls public comments No phone calls. Oh, okay then. Any questions? Anybody else? Pam, anything on your end? Yep, sounds good to me. Okay. Talk wash, we're good? Yep. All right. Thank you. Meetings of the court, motion to adjourn. Everybody in agreement, say aye. Opposed? No? Night. Thank you.